If you're thinking of building an angled neck for your guitar, you're probably considering doing a scarf joint. There are a couple of types and many methods to go about it. And I know it seems a bit daunting for the less experienced. Well, if you stick around, I promise that by the end of this video, you will know everything you need to get started with scarf joints. I'll break it down and go step by step plus a little something nobody told you. So join me, let's make a scarf joint. Hi, I'm Yav and this is the Electric Luthier. Until Leo Fender came up with the flat headstock, pretty much all the guitars had an angled headstock. The strings need to have a break angle at the nut and it makes total sense to tilt the headstock backwards. Till this day many electric guitars and most notably Gibsons have an angle even up to 17 degrees. Many companies have had variations on that and I won't go into the pros and cons of flat versus angled headstocks. I've already done that in a recent video which I will link up here and in the description. The one major downside of a tilted headstock is its vulnerability to breakage and many luthiers would agree that the best method to remedy that is the scarf joint. A properly glued scarf joint will make the headstock much stronger and this is what we want here. So how does it work? The idea behind the scarf joint is to avoid having short parallel grain running across the headstock and instead cut and paste the long grain in an angle. There are two variations to this joint, each with its own pros and cons. Before we start cutting, we need to decide on the variation we desire as the cut may be in a very different place. So the first method, let's call it A, cuts the headstock part at an angle, then flips it and glues it underneath the neck to continue the angle. The second method cuts a significantly longer piece for the headstock, again flips it, but glues it in front as an extension of the neck. So on the practical side of things, the cut piece or the position of the cut needs to be very different. Before we do some simple math, let's talk about the differences. First is strength. That's why we're doing this in the first place. Now properly done, both methods should be fine and be stronger than without it. As far as gluing surface, method B is slightly favored. If we correct the thickness of the headstock, we see that we actually lose a little bit of gluing surface. Now one could argue that in method B there is some more leverage against the joint by the strings as the joint is farther from the tuners. To counter that, you could say that method B has an advantage in that the headstock piece is sandwiched between the neck and the fretboard and that provides extra strength. Let me know below if you know of any other argument as far as the mechanics of this joint. Now as far as looks, it's quite simple. How visible the joint is going to be depends on the type of wood and the quality of the joint, but mostly on whether you're going to cover it. If you're going with a flat color, it makes no difference. Type A joint will have a visible line running across the middle of the headstock. So if you're painting or putting a veneer on the headstock face, you may only see it on the sides and at the end of the neck, right behind the nut. Type B will work better with the naked headstock and will only have a visible seam behind the nut and diagonally on the sides of the neck. How do we approach building either one or both of them? Well, we start with the neck blank. 
This can be a laminated neck or a single piece. You want it to be at least as wide as your heel. But if you want to save the trouble of gluing wings for the wider headstock later, have it wider. A vintage Gibson headstock is 3 inches, which are 78 millimeters, and it's one of the widest, if not the widest. As far as thickness, if I'm ignoring the heel, it can be as thin as 20 millimeters, or just under an inch. If you are doing a Gibson style set neck, your heel is what will determine the thickness. Another consideration for thickness is if you're planning on a chunky volute. You should have enough meat left, even with a one inch blank, but if you want more, just take it into account. Where it may get a little confusing is the length. So let's break it down. In the A method, your neck is going to be longer, but the headstock piece is shorter. In method B, the neck only reaches to the nut, but the headstock piece will be longer and extend to the neck. Let's put some numbers on that to get a better sense of the size. I'll use a vintage Les Paul as an example because A, they're fairly consistent with most Gibsons, and B, I assume if you're tilting the headstock back, it's not going to be a strat. Now for PRS builders, take into account the longer scale length and the longer fretboard. At this point, you should have a few inches to spare regardless of the style of the guitar. And I will round up the measurements as well. So if our fretboard is 18 inches, which are 457 millimeters, and our headstock is 180 millimeters or seven inches, we can add a couple of inches for the cut itself and some sanding, and we get about 640 millimeters or 25 inches. I did not take into account the actual angle you're using, but in fact, it makes little difference to the size. You are, however, going to have a longer cut with much more gluing surface if you're using shallower angles. In fact, there is no difference in length. The only difference is where you position the cut on the same neck blank. Regardless of the chosen method, a good point to start from is the nut. Method A will have the cut start at the nut in the front of the neck and cut diagonally towards the back of the headstock, whereas method B will start at the back of the nut and work diagonally towards the front of the neck. Now when it comes to cutting, the most commonly used tool is a bandsaw. For that, you have to make sure you have a perfect 90 degree angle on your blank. A thicker blank will also give better stability because it's standing on its side and it'll be more comfortable. Sadly, not everyone has a bandsaw and other alternatives are available. Now cutting manually and achieving a straight cut at a sharp angle is not easy if you're not experienced and have a good sharp saw. As with other methods, a simple jig which I would make from plywood or MDF, can be a lifesaver here. The little angular parts can be much easier to control. A large enough table saw can also do the trick. Here too, a simple jig would help just to stabilize and give the right angle. If you'd like me to do a video on a specific jig, please let me know in the comments below and I'll try and make it happen. I'm going to be using a miter saw, which I will assume more of you have than a band saw. It does need to have a blade large enough to cut the full width of the neck, and it needs to be at 90 degrees from its table, vertically that is. Most miter saws can't really cut this sharp of an angle, so the tricky part with cutting a very sharp angle is holding it and for that, you've guessed right, a jig.
Now I could either make the jig with a desired angle or just make it at 90 degrees and give the angle itself with the miter saw. After all, that's one of its main features. I decide to go with the 90 degrees for the jig. It leaves me the option of changing the angle later on the fly. I take a thick leftover piece, cut it straight and attach a long enough piece of plywood which is close to the width of the neck. I just used three screws and countersink them so they wouldn't be in the way. Done! All this jig needs to do is hold the neck or headstock piece and be long enough to leave enough room for the clamp. Now the only problem with this cutting method is that you can't really cut in the middle of the neck blank like everyone else I've ever seen do it. But let's take a step back and think. Do you really need to? All you need here are two pieces that match in angle. Eventually they're not going to be the same thickness because the headstock is thinner than the neck itself and they don't need to have the same width because the headstock is always wider. Come to think of it, you can use a shorter and skinnier piece for the neck and match it with a thinner and wider piece for the headstock. You don't have to, but this may open a whole lot of new options. For example, I've experimented with a few less than ideal lumber bits with necks I've laminated a few months ago. They are a combination of poplar and ipea, or ipea, which is one of the hardest woods I've come across. One of the necks settled into a slight warp. Nothing extreme, but just enough to not want to make a neck out of it. I could, however, make it into a nice matching headstock for the other blanks. I need to remove material and sand it into a headstock thickness anyway. This will give me a lot more wiggle room for errors when I cut the neck blanks. I set the saw to 10 degrees and attach the headstock blank to the jig with a clamp. Now any angle from 7 degrees and up will do the job, so it's really a matter of personal preference and aesthetics. On the practical side of things, you just need to make sure you have the same angle on both pieces if you're cutting them separately like I'm doing. Other than safety concerns with these kinds of awkward cuts, you want to avoid any pressure and unnecessary force which can slightly skew the angle of the blade. The clunky guard works smoothly with beams and nice square cuts, but may be in the way for a smooth continuous cut like I'm doing here. I hold it up and try and use as little force as I can to lower the blade. I did, as you should, cut a few scrap pieces to get my technique in tune. For demonstration purposes, I'll be making both a Type A and a Type B scarf joint. This will also give me the option of deciding which one I want only after it's done. Notice the clean cut the circular saw gives. A bandsaw will always, especially if cutting by eye, give a more jaggedy result. Just saying. If your saw is accurate and you work it gently, you can also get an almost perfectly square cut, which is what you want for proper gluing. My next step before perfecting the shape is to get the headstock part to their final thickness. It's a bit over 20 millimeters and I want it somewhere around 15. So sanding is not really a good option. A planer you can run it through would be ideal and you can also hand plane it or cut it with a bandsaw. Now being the rebel I am, I want to try this little surfacing router bit that I actually got for a CNC. I'll be using my extended base trimmer to glide backwards while removing material and moving sideways.
This is a similar method to surfacing with a router and a slide, but without the need for the two rails. Towards the end, where I run out of room, I shift to a second piece of the same thickness, so I can glide sideways. I then go into some very out of focus sanding, and I try to maintain, if not improve, the squareness of the surfaces. A belt sander would be preferable here, but if you're sanding manually, use a large block or a sanding beam. And another option is attaching a sheet of stripe or sandpaper to a flat surface and running the piece on top of it. For gluing purposes, you don't need high grit paper. In fact, too smooth a surface will not adhere as well. More importantly, you just want them to be square and flat. Once both pieces are ready, or four pieces for the two pairs I'm making, it's time for dry clamping. I use the scraps from the cutting to perch the neck so I can have comfortable access. I use spring clamps to position the headstock piece on top of the neck for a B-style joint. Using a ruler or a straight edge, I make sure it's aligned to both the surface of the neck and the center line. With four clamps holding it, I drill two holes on the parts of the neck which will later be carved out and put a couple of screws. These screws will ensure there's no slipping and sliding when I have the glue and start applying pressure. Slippage is bad enough with flat surfaces, and this angle joint can be a nightmare to keep in place. I find this unelegant method most effective and easy to implement. I double check that my alignment hasn't moved, remove the screws, and apply the glue. I've recently made a $3 investment in a silicone spatula and I cannot tell you how happy it made me. No more messy fingers, crappy business cards and other pieces of crap. This is so clean and comfortable, I wonder how it didn't make its way from the kitchen to the workshop before. I want to dedicate a video just for that. Okay, back to our gluing. After generously applying glue, I make sure the screws are sticking out a bit and easily find the correct position. I use the spring clamps just to hold tightly enough to screw it in place. I do a rough cleanup of the initial squeeze out and remove the spring clamps for proper clamping. I put some parchment or baking sheets to avoid sticking of the things that shouldn't. I repeat the same steps with the other neck, this time I'm going for an A method. So the headstock piece is glued under the neck. In this case, you also need to work out where to put the screws so they're outside the shape of your headstock. If you really trust yourself and like living on the edge, you can put one of the screws where one of the peg holes will later be drilled. Did I mention the silicone spatula? Now my main concern when clamping this joint is not the amount of force, but how even it is spread. That's why I'm putting only two clamps, but putting much wider pieces under them to spread the pressure. If you are eager to continue working on the neck, three hours or so should be plenty but I would give it overnight to fully cure before applying any pressure on it. That's pretty much it. I now have two scarf joint neck blanks, one done with each method. Since the seven string I'm currently working on has a painted headstock, I may pick the type A method as the seam on the front will be covered. I hope this video was helpful to skip the little scarf joint hurdle or in any other way. If it did, and if you want to see the rest of the adventures of these necks,
Please like, subscribe, and let me know what you think in the comments below. There's plenty more information on my website, theelectricluthier.com. And until next time, go on, build a guitar with a scarf joint.